today, Jazz Library focuses on a British-born musician who's also one of the greatest of all jazz guitarists, John McLaughlin. Later this month, on Sunday the 23rd of November, there's the climax of this year's Radio 3 London Jazz Festival with a concert at the Royal Festival Hall by a new supergroup, the Five Piece Band, co-led by Chick Corea and the subject of today's programme, John McLaughlin. A few weeks ago I caught up with John to look back over his extensive recording career and select some of the highlights for the Jazz Library. And we began by going back to 1969 and the album that I started with, which many of us regarded at the time as an absolute masterpiece of British jazz, Extrapolation. Well, it's very nice for you to say that, because it was really my first recording in which I was recording my own music. For me, it's like a painting, one of my first paintings, which is basically what recordings are. They're frozen images in sound. But I was very happy to have had the opportunity to record, really, my music, because I'd been writing music since I was at school. So by the time I recorded this, I had an album's worth of music. And to have been able to play with John Sermon, and uh, normally Dave Holland would have been on bass because he was in the band. I had a quartet. The recording, fortunately, I think was the timing that helped because by the time I finished the recording, or rather just after the recording was finished, I went over to play with Tony Williams and Larry Young in New York in the Lifetime Group. And the record came out after I had gone, which I think really helped it. The fact that I'd gone, you know, it was big news that one of the boys from the UK go over and play with the greats in America. Now you talked about the fact that you'd written a lot of music by the time the album came up, and the track we're going to hear is called Binky's Beam, which I think has a story behind it as well. It was written in memory of two brothers, I think. Uh, two brothers. Binky was a bass guitar player, and he was in a formation that was actually put together by Pete Brown, a modern day poet who did a lot of the lyrics for the cream but i played with him on a number of occasions and binky was in the band and he was a quite startling talent and really inspired me to write this little piece for him i think shortly after that he disappeared completely off the scene and i heard all kinds of strange rumors and none of which have ever been confirmed to me, but all I know is that he disappeared completely. And I found that very tragic because he was a great talent. He would have been up there in terms of great bass players in the world. Binky's been from the album Extrapolation, and that's still just about available on the Polydor label. It was recorded in January 69, in fact, with John McLaughlin on guitar, my guest today, John Sermon on baritone, Brian Hodges on bass, and Tony Oxley drums. It struck me listening to that, that Tony Oxley, who we now think of very much in terms of the free and the avant-garde and the kind of textural side of drumming, was really going for it on that track. I love Tony Oxley. The first time I really got to play with Tony Oxley would be in the Gordon Beck Quartet with Jeff Klein, whom I just saw recently at the Czech Korea concert in London that he did with Bella Fleck. And uh, it was a real pleasure to see him. He was the bass player in the band. And Tony Oxley... I was just delighted. These boots are made for walking, and that comes from the album Experiments with Pops, Gordon Beck's quartet in 1967, with John McLaughlin, guitar, Jeff Klein, bass, and Tony Oxley, drums. That was reissued just a couple of years ago or so on the Art of Life label, having originally been out on LP on Major Minor back in the 60s. John mentioned that when his own album, Extrapolation, appeared, he'd already gone to New York to work with Miles Davis's drummer Tony Williams in his new band, Lifetime. I got a call from Dave Holland. Dave and I were living together before he left for the US and he was in the extrapolation band. He was replaced by Brian Hodges, great bass player. But in any event, Dave got the gig with Miles. It must have been sometime in July. Miles walked into Ronnie Scott's and saw Dave playing and said, you want a gig, you know, come and join my band. And, you know, we were thrilled. Dave's going to go over and join Miles. Anyway, on November, 68 he called me and he said i've got somebody who wants to talk to you and i found out that tony had listened to a tape that had been recorded by jack de Jeanette, who had been at ronnie scott's that summer also with bill evans trio 
and Jack loved to jam. And so Dave and I, we went to jam with him at Ronnie Scott's in the afternoon. And unbeknown to me, Jack recorded this jam session. He went back and one day, Tony, who was considering leaving Miles' group and forming Lifetime, was talking to Jack and said, I'm looking for a guitar player, you know? And Jack said, really? Well, listen to this guy, because I just played with him, with Dave Holland, who was with Miles by this time. And so Dave and Tony were playing together. And so uh, they heard about me and Tony called me and said, I want to do Lifetime with you, which was just a thrill, absolute thrill. But of course, we had to get some things together and Ronnie Scott was very kind to me, God bless him. Because at that time I had a special paper to get my visa to go to America. It was a little tricky in those days. But it was really one of the greatest things that could have happened to me, I think, to get this call from Tony. Well, that's Allah be praised by Tony Williams' Lifetime. Lifetime's slightly hard to get hold of these days, but this is on a Verve album of John McLaughlin material called Compact Jazz. So you can find that amongst a number of other relatively early recordings by John and some more recent tracks which we might come on to later. But John, the key thing about that, the piece was written by Larry Young, who played organ there, and it's a dramatic updating, really, of the organ trio. I mean, the way that you and he worked together was quite splendid. I didn't even know until the first rehearsal who was in Lifetime, except Tony and me. And when I walked into the, the Baron Club, which was where Tony was playing with Miles, finishing the last week, this is how I got to meet Miles on the same day, because we rehearsed in the afternoon, because Tony's drums were set up at the Baron Club up in Harlem. And in walked Larry Young. And I was so thrilled, because Larry had made these recordings, like... Complete Unity, I think it's called, with Woody Shaw, Joe Henderson, and Elvin. And he'd done recording with Grant Green, this great guitar player. And he was the new Hammond organ player. And I'd grown up with Hammond organ, of course, with Mike Carr Trio, with Georgie Fame, Graham Bond, which is where, of course, I got to play with Ginger Baker and Jack Bruce for the first time. That was a very interesting group. Grass is Greener, that's the Graham Bond organisation with Graham on alto plus John McLaughlin guitar, Jack Bruce bass and Ginger Baker drums. It's currently available from Rhino on a CD called Solid Bond. And that also features Graham's trio with Dick Hextel-Smith and John Heisman. John McLaughlin, it turned out, had joined the group from the Blue Flames. I left Georgie Fame's band before he made it big because I like the musical provocation that was in Graham's band, because Ginger was a great drummer and Jack was a great bass player. And Graham, God bless him, was a wild man on the organ and playing alto sax at the same time. I mean, this was special. But the music was really jazz R&B, and R&B was very much part of jazz to me. It still is today. It's got the blues thing, which you cannot take away from jazz. So... It must have been in late 69 that Jack came into New York with one of his bands. Cream had broken up by this time. He was playing at the Fillmore East, and I called Tony. I said, you know, Jack's playing in town. Let's go down and just say hi. They got on very well together. And Tony, because basically Lifetime was Tony's band, Tony was the originator of the band with the name. I mean, I know things came out from Lifetime eventually under my name, but it's not correct, actually. It should have been under Tony's name. But they really hit it off very well. And Tony wanted to go try to get a little bit more commercial success, which we need. You need to have a certain amount of sales and a certain amount of audience attendance just to keep a band together. And Lifetime was notoriously successful musically, but notoriously unsuccessful commercially. I was lucky because when I wasn't playing with Lifetime, Miles had me playing with him. So I had the best of both worlds. I was very fortunate in that way. But Jack came in and we did a recording called Turn It Over. And the music did change. And Jack was singing in the band. But he was a great singer. And we carried on for another year with Lifetime, but musically it really was very important, especially for me, Alan, because with Miles, Miles directed everything and everybody, but in a wonderful way, and everybody was delighted just to do it. All of Miles' musicians, they loved him, and me too. 
and I still do today, I miss him. And we were just happy to go whichever way Miles wanted to go. And sometimes he didn't even know which way he was going, but that's what made it interesting. With Tony, he was a very schooled musician. He studied harmony at Juilliard, which is one of the most prestigious schools in New York. And he really encouraged me to write. He liked the way I wrote music. He liked the music that I wrote. And he constantly encouraged me to write for a lifetime, which I did. And I would say it's very safe to say that the groundwork of all the music from Mahavishnu was done in lifetime because of Tony's encouragement. Tony Williams' Lifetime and part of Emergency, which, like the previous Lifetime track, is included on the Compact Verve anthology by today's Jazz Library subject here on Radio 3, John McLaughlin. Just before we heard that track, John mentioned his very different working experiences with Miles Davis. Miles was, in a way, like a Zen master, and I'm a big fan of Zen, incidentally. And I don't know if you know what the Zen koans are, but they're very illogical statements that are designed to blow the mind of the student. It means put him in a different state where he's not thinking logically anymore. He's thinking illogically. And I don't think Miles even was aware. He was aware in his own way, but his instincts were impeccable. And he would do this to everyone in the studio, not on live, live he just let you go. I mean, he was happy just to let you go. But in the studio, he would come up with the most. I mean, there's a very well-known one that the first time I was in the studio with him, which was the second day I was in New York, we were running down In a Silent Way, a very wonderful recording from Miles. In a Silent Way is a tune from Joe Zawinul, who was on the session with Herbie, with Chick. There's three giants on the keyboard right there. And Miles liked Joe's music. He always liked Joe's music. So In a Silent Way was a beautiful melody, but Joe had it with much more complex harmony that he finally did with Wayne in duet, which is astounding. Anyway, Miles didn't like it in 69. He wasn't happy with the way it sounded, so he stopped everything, and he said to me, play it on the guitar, because he didn't have a voice. Anyway, I had a part and it had all of these piano chords on it with the melody. I said, you want the piano chords with the melody? Yeah, I want everything. So I said, that's going to take a minute for me just to go on the... Is that a fact? (laughs) Just to make me sweat a little more. So I'm there and the sweat is rolling off me. I'm I'm looking at the music and saying, okay, I can do this there. And And then he suddenly says, play it like you don't know how to play the guitar. In which is more zen you die. And, I heard, and the musicians heard that, they said, mm, that's a good one, that's a good one. <laughs> because they all knew Miles would come up and say something to everyone in the session that would really <laughs> knock them out of their socks. And I'm thinking, <laughs> what does he mean? <laughs> what does he mean, you know? So a few seconds go by, and each second is like a month, and the sweat is rolling off me. I say, well, screw it. You know, I know one chord on guitar. I know E chord. I'm going to play it in E I'm going to play it the way I want to do it. Okay, that's what he said, let's go. He had the light on already when I started, the recording light. So I play the melody very slow, just, and I just threw all the chords out. And I heard Wayne come in, I said, it sounds very nice. And then Miles and Wayne came in, and we finished the tune. And Miles had played back Tio, Tio Macero. And I heard it, and I was really astonished that the least I can say about astonished. I was dumbfounded how amazing it sounded and how amazing Miles had used me to transform that tune into something completely different in a way that I would have never ever imagined possible. In a Silent Way, the title track of the album, which is still available from Columbia. And if you want the full personnel, then look on the Jazz Library website. That's www.bbc.co.uk slash radio3 slash jazz library. And you'll find the details of this program up on that site from the time of transmission today. This was the beginning of my association with Miles. I should just mention in passing that he was an unbelievable human being. From after this recording of In a Silent Way, he would invite me over to his house a lot because he really wanted guitar. I mean, he wanted me in the band, actually. 
but I had this thing with Lifetime. So he said, well, every time you're not working with Lifetime, you come on the road with me, which was a perfect situation for me. But I used to go over to his house because he wanted to hear guitar. He wanted to have more and more guitar in the band. And so I would do more and more recordings with him, you know, Bitches Brew and the other recordings over the years. Now don't play it up and go down. Go ahead, John, play. Play it up, play it up, and then drop down. Bang, 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 bang. One of the many tracks featuring today's Jazz Library subject, John McLaughlin, from the complete Jack Johnson sessions by Miles Davis on Columbia. The bassist, who I thought really interacted there with John, was Michael Henderson, and Billy Cobham was on drums with Herbie Hancock organ. That was recorded in April 1970, during one of John's periods of working with Miles in between Lifetime tours. In those days, Lifetime, we were struggling economically. You know, I was really just making it. Commercially, it was not very successful. But every time I was at Miles' house, and I would say goodbye, he'd say, are you eating? You know, and he'd stuff a hundred dollar bill in my pocket, you know. I never ever asked him for anything, but he would just give me money all the time, made sure that I ate and I could pay my rent. And that I'll never forget. Well now we've got to the moment, John, you mentioned a little while ago that Lifetime had provided a huge building block for you in creating the music and the body of work that was going to be Mahavishnu. But as well as that, I mean, what were the steps that led you? I mean, obviously, Lifetime was failing. However much you all wanted it to go on, it wasn't going to work in the way that perhaps you'd all hoped at one stage. But what were the steps that led you to form Mahavishnu? Well, I have to come back to Miles because it's directly related to him. And it must have been around October 1970. I was on the road with Miles and we just finished a gig at Lenny's on the Turnpike, which was a little club outside of Boston. And the musicians had gone. There was only Miles and myself in the little band room at the back. And we were just chatting. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, he turned to me and he said, it's time you formed your own band, which really threw a loop at me because he was, without doubt, the most honest person I'd ever met. Brutally honest but that was great. He always knew exactly where you were with him. Always. There's no ambiguity in your relationship. And so when he told me that, I hadn't considered it at all. But you have to look at it from my point of view here, Alan, because here we have this man that I've been admiring since the age of 15 or 16. And now I'm playing with him. I've been playing with him on and off for the last couple of years almost, and he tells me to form my own band. This is very serious. This is a serious statement. If he says it to me, then I should do it, because he said it to me. Nobody else said it to me, but he did. So, in a way, I have to justify his faith in me. That's the way I saw it. Because all of these years of admiration and affection, really, because he was like a godfather to me when I arrived in America, I had to do something to justify this statement because it came straight from his heart, you know. And so I didn't say anything to him subsequently about it, but of course I started thinking about it. And that was the beginning of the Mahavishnu Orchestra. But I should say, though, that there again, he helped in terms of the drummer, Billy Cobham, because Billy had been invited by Miles on the Jack Johnson sessions, and Billy and I really hit it off. And he was the first one I asked about the band, about coming with me in my band, and Billy was in. And really, that was the beginning. And after it took me about five or six months to put it all together. We came out, and Miles came to see us, of course, when we were playing in New York. It was great. But he always used to come and see us, to see me, if he was free, that was always a very unnerving experience because he'd hear everything, every note. But I would play every note for him anyway, you know. The track that we're going to play is, in some sense, a very obvious one. I mean, it's the opening track of Inner Mounting Flame, Meeting of the Spirits. And it was the thing that if, if you bought the record and you put it on, this was the first experience we all had of what the band sounded like. <laughs> Well, from 1972, that's Meeting of the Spirits, the Mahavishnu Orchestra on Inner Mounting Flame, which is still available on Sony. And 
the band, John McLaughlin, my guest on guitar, Billy Cobb and drums, Rick Laird on bass with Jan Hammer on keyboards, Jerry Goodman violin. And it's also, John, I mean, it seems to me that this is your writing actually coming full circle. I mean, there are things, ideas that we'd heard partly formed in extrapolation, which are now concretizing in a way, the way that the three of you, Jan Hammer and Jerry Goodman, you play the themes together, the way that you got these very intricate themes opening up periods of space. It's not exactly a template for the future, but it's very much a consolidation of, of where you got to, it seems to me, at that stage. Yes, I mean, I just go on my own instincts. Already in extrapolation, you can hear my experiments with different time signatures, and this really came to full fruition with the Mahavishnu Orchestra. What was great about the Mahavishnu Orchestra was the fact that I brought the violin in. But I didn't want a jazz violin player in the band. I wanted a rock blues violin player. So I had such a round. Finally, I had this band called Flock. It was based in Chicago with Jerry Goodman. And I heard this guy play. And I never heard rock violin or blues violin before or since. Jerry was really unique in that. And I thought he was perfect for electric guitar and electric violin together. And it really worked a dream. It was great. Rick Laird, the bass player, we were together with Brian Auger, great bass player, and he was ready to come to America. I think he was living in London at that time. But Miles is behind it. He said, do it, and I did it. It's as simple as that. A lot of the Mahavishnu Orchestra albums have a sort of softer side, and the track I was going to suggest we play is Thousand Island Park, which is very much acoustic and about as different from what we've just heard as it's possible to get. So two things really John the acoustic strain seems to have come right the way through all your writing but secondly obviously an interest in the instrument itself and the varieties of it well I think we have to go back in the past again because the first guitar that I ever held in my hands was an acoustic guitar I didn't even know what an electric guitar was we're going back some years here Alan this would be uh, I was 11 it was 1953 it's a beautiful instrument, and it's my instrument. The electric guitar is another form of the guitar. It's like, I guess it's like a keyboard player playing acoustic piano and synthesizer. It's got a different atmosphere, but it has a different vibe to it. And you can say things with one that you cannot with the other. And so I can express things on the acoustic guitar that cannot be expressed on the electric guitar. It's really as simple as that. 